Um, so I'm just going to begin by introducing um, the team who have helped put this on. Um, and then I'm going to hand over um, to others for introduction of the talk proper. Um, so firstly, thank you to two of our digital learning developers who are going to help moderate today's event, um, just in case we get far too many people to handle. Um, so that is former students of mine, actually, James Brace and Josh Aldridge. Um, to begin with, I'm going to hand over to Beth Scott and Chris Sinclair. Um, because this is a joint event between the Penryn and Streatham Math Societies. Um, so they're going to just introduce the respective societies and how you can get involved. Um, and main thanks for getting this event off the ground, then go to James Arthur, who met the speaker at a Maths Jam event, I believe, earlier this summer. So after Beth and Chris have um, introduced themselves, then James is going to introduce Sydney. Um, so anyway, over to you, Beth, I guess. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Beth, and I'm the president of the Streatham Math Society. Um, you can get involved by looking at any of our social media and our website on the Guild webpage. I just want to say a big thank you to Sydney, Chris, James, and Tim for helping this uh, event happen. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Chris. I'm president of the Penryn Math Society. Uh, the same, you can get involved with it with uh, social media and uh, you know, everyone on the Penryn campus probably already knows about it. So it's all good. Yeah, and thank you to Sydney and thanks to uh, James and Beth. There's partial funding from the Streatham Society. And uh, yeah, it wouldn't have happened without the Streatham Society, I don't think, not to this scale anyway. So thanks very much. Right, um, I think I've got to introduce Sydney. I could take the blurb of her website. It says she's a nine time gold medalist professional speed cooper. She loves sharing mathematics with people around the world of all ages using the cube as a interesting medium. I believe today she's going to talk more about the cube in a mathematical sense. So she's going to talk about uh, group theory and permutations and just the Rubik's cube and mass. So, Go on, Sydney. Tell us about the cube. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for that introduction. Before I get started, I do want to go ahead and thank everybody else, Beth, James, Tim, Chris, and everyone else who helped make this happen. I'm very happy to be here today and share with you about the Rubik's Cube and math. So uh, to start off, I'd like to give a brief introduction to myself, just so you know, well, why do you want to hear about the cube from me? I am a nine-time gold medalist. I have been solving the cube uh, for the past eight years, or since I was 14 years old. And I travel all across the world teaching people about the cube, whether it be in a mathematical sense or a practical sense. And I was also the first female to do quite a bit in cubing. I have a few of those achievements listed below. And also before we start, I know all of you would probably love to see a speed demo. So we're gonna have one speed demo now of a speed solve and then one later on in the presentation. So let me adjust my webcam and I have a timer right here. Anybody wanna put any guesses in the chat as to how fast it'll be? I'll give a you know, 10, 15 seconds for that uh, to get guesses in. One second, oh, that's <laughs> too kind. Nine <laughs> seconds, it could be doable, 10. <laughs> All right, I see we have a whole bunch of guesses. I am going to start. Ten seconds. <laughs> All right, so now that we have the demo out of the way, I want to start telling you about the cube and math. So first, when starting off, we're going to start with a few maybe the less entertaining things, but it's some things that are going to clarify earlier. So uh, the kind of math we can explore using the cube are subgroups, because the cube is made up of multiple subgroups, cycles, because when the pieces move around, orders because we have a lot of algorithms and groups interacting with one another, commutators and conjugates, um, which again kind of goes with the groups. All of these work into group theory, and why this is also the Rubik's Cube and group theory. And then permutations. Um, I'll show you how to calculate the amount of positions on a Rubik's Cube, which can be a lot of fun. 
So the first thing we're going to look at is what are the subgroups on a cube? Because we have multiple different pieces. The first ones we can look at are the center pieces. Each one of these have one sticker and they don't change position. We have the edge pieces, which have two stickers and the corner pieces, which have three stickers. We just need to note that all of these have different attributions and this will play a role later on. Um, and also to note, no one subgroup or piece can occupy another piece of spot barring turning too fast, which is what happened in these photos, but otherwise it's impossible. Um, and then, you know, just for fun, we can talk about a little bit about something like the five by five, which has additional subgroups. You can see them labeled here where it's just bigger. And once again, these groups can't occupy a spot of the other one, but they do interact with each other when you do a turn. So next, I want to get um, some definitions out of the way. So we have um, orientation versus permutation. This is really simple. The orientation is a direction of pieces facing. You can see simply on my cube right here, this white face is oriented, but it's not permuted because these pieces are in the wrong spot. Um, and these pieces right here are permuted, but they are not oriented. Just a simple definitions that we'll be dealing with later on to make sure that things are clear. All right, now we're gonna start talking a little bit about cycles. So a cycle is how pieces move around. So it, in this example, if three corners change places, that is a three cycle. That's the colloquialism that we use within cubing. There might be some other math name for it, but that's the basic idea. And we have orders. So cycles and orders are gonna play kind of a, a big role. Uh, they're gonna interact with each other a lot. So we can look at this right here which is a single turn on the cube. And all you need to know for this is that uh, each face of the cube is represented by a letter. We can see the right face turning. And we can say that the order of this turn is four, because if I were to turn this cube four times or this side four times, we would say it would return to a solve state. So it has an order of four. Now this stands true for whatever algorithm that we do. It, we, no matter how many times we do it over and over, it will eventually solve itself. And we can use some math to actually help us figure that out. Um, so first we need to look at what happens during one single turn. And we can see here, I have labeled this cube, uh, one, two, three, four, all the way up to nine. And we can see that one goes to three, three goes to uh, nine, nine goes to seven, seven goes to one and so forth. And the only piece that doesn't change position is piece number five. And we can say that no matter what we're doing on a cube, it's one turn plus one turn plus one turn. So an even number of swaps is occurring between the corner subgroup and the edge subgroup while the center pieces aren't changing position. So now I wanna actually uh, get up a virtual cube here so we can explore a few of these algorithms. Can you see this virtual cube? Should be able we to. You can, Sydney. All right, so I have here, um, first algorithm we're gonna look at, which, uh, so we've already discussed that something like the move R has an order of four. So I'll just put that in real quick so we can see that if I were to put this in four times, the cube would in fact, become solved afterwards. That's that's really trivial. But what if we take a look at something a little bit more uh, advanced, this algorithm right here. So if I were to let this play out, what would be the potential order of it? Well, since it's only affecting three pieces, we have a little bit of an easier time. We can say that when the cube was solved, it initially started with this piece right here, this blue orange uh, white piece initially started over here. And this uh, white green orange piece initially started here and this white blue red piece initially started over here. So you might be able to get an idea of what I'm getting at is that, okay, these pieces shifted their position uh, in a clockwise fashion, but not only did they change their permutation, they also changed their orientation. Uh, you can see that each one of these has been twisted in another direction. So if I were to take this algorithm and input it again, we're going to see another cycle that occurred. We can see that, okay, this piece, which was previously here, we can see that they all went around in a, in a clockwise fashion as well as the corner pieces twisted. So I think it would be pretty safe to say that the order of this algorithm is going to be three. And we can you know, go ahead and see that real quick by putting this in here. Um, 
I'll go ahead and let it play through one last time. We can see that, OK, this does become solved. Um, there's also some things to note, and some of you who might be uh, into group theory more heavily might already notice that the, this algorithm right here is a commutator. We'll be touching on those in a bit, but it is fun to note how this algorithm is actually working. Um, so that was a little, not quite as trivial as R, but a little bit easier. Um, and I'll show you an even easier example. I'd actually skipped over this one, which is going to be this one right here. And we can say that, okay, so for this algorithm, this was done on a solved cube. These pieces shifted in a counterclockwise fashion or anti-clockwise as uh, you would say over there. So we can say that very easily after doing this um, three times, it will become solved again. So once again, that would become an order of three. Now, of course, each one of these algorithms that uh, anyone that you can encounter has a different order. But regardless of how random it is, we can, in fact, figure out the order by acknowledging what's happening during these turns. So this next one is one of my favorite examples to show because it looks very difficult to figure out. Um, the other ones only affected a small number of pieces or a very small number of subgroups. Uh, but this is going to affect a lot more. So this one right here we can look and say, what even happened during this algorithm? How do we begin to sort out how long the order will be? Now to cheat, you could just do it over and over and over again on your cube and just count it. But we want a more fun way to do that. So looking at what happened during this, and I'll go ahead and let it just play out so you can get an idea. We can see, well, there's a lot going on. A lot of orientation has changed and a lot of permutation has changed. So if we were to start studying each one of these pieces, we can say, OK, the bottom half of the cube, the bottom two thirds were not affected. So we don't need to pay attention to them. Then moving along to these two pieces, we can say, OK, these two pieces were not affected either. So we could you know, just block them from our head, block them from our memory. We don't need them. Then we can look at these two pieces right here. So we already remember that the edge pieces have two stickers, and that would mean that they have two possible orientations. So this piece has flipped. So if I were to do it, the algorithm again, we can say this piece will be flipped and solved. But this piece right here, this corner piece, if I were to do the algorithm again, this white piece right here, this white sticker would be right here because it is being rotated in a clockwise manner. So some of you might be able to see where I'm going with this is that we can first determine, OK, what is the lowest common multiple of this right here, the fact that this will need two, an order of two to solve, and the fact that this will need an order of three for just these two specific pieces to be solved. So you might have already caught on that we will take six times to get these two specifically solved. So we can go ahead and note that minimum, this entire algorithm will take that. But if we move over to these ones, we need to look at what their minimum order will be. So we have a little bit more of funky stuff going on here. So we have this piece right here, which has changed position with this orange and white piece. So we can say that the next time we do this algorithm, this orange and white piece will return to its spot. And so will this green and white piece. However, this green and white piece will be flipped. So once again, we need to figure out what is the lowest common multiple for that swap to take place. And I'll let you think on that for a bit. And then we have these two pieces right here, where once again, we have these two pieces change position, this uh, green, white, red corner, change position with this uh, white, green, and orange corner. But this one twisted position. Now, this one's going to be a little bit harder to track because this was being twisted uh, counterclockwise. So we need to figure out what would be the minimum between these. So to recap, we're saying that these two will take at least six times of doing the algorithm to return to a solved state. And let's just go ahead and see that right here. I'll go ahead and input this six times. So we could say that that did indeed stand true for these two pieces that we were looking at. And we can also see that we were having some issues with these pieces. So if we go back to the initial state of the cube, we can still try to figure out uh, what the order of it will be. Um, now I'll go ahead and tell you that the order of this algorithm, the entire algorithm is 12, and I'm just gonna put this in, in a fancy way. 
And once again, this is because of how these pieces are interacting with one another. Um, so uh, when letting this play out, I'll just let this play out and talk a bit. So once again, using the same logic, we can figure out the order of any algorithm, regardless of how long or how short it is. And like I said, this is one of my favorite examples to use because we have only the top layer affected, but we have a lot of orientation and uh, permutation going on, but it's easy enough to track and not too intimidating. Um, now we have one last one to figure out uh, before we move on to commutators, and that's going to be a simple algorithm of RU. Sorry, I'm trying to let this finish playing out. We'll just cut that off. <laughs> so something like RU. Very, very simple, but the order seems like it could be a pain to figure out how, what is a shortcut that we could possibly take to figure this out? And I want to see if there's anything going on in the chat. Okay. So we could see that, okay, this piece right here goes up here, this one goes uh, right here, but that's, that's a lot to figure out. I could name this for each and every single one of the pieces. We can cheat a little. What we can do is say, okay, I wanna see how many times do I have to do this algorithm before the edges or the corners are solved? Kind of like how we were looking at just two little pieces um, before on the last example. So if I were to keep doing this algorithm, which would be a little bit of fun to type out. And I can eventually say that um, the edges will be solved. Let me just get this. All right, so after doing it 28 times, we can say that the edges were solved. Now we need to figure out how many times we have to do it before the corners are, so uh, corners are solved. Um, and we can go ahead and keep doing that. And I'm, I'm very bad because I forget the number off the top of my head, so I have to manually input this. But once we figure out how long it takes for the corners, we can take the initial number of 28 and find its lowest common multiple to the corner number. So we have 60. Does anybody know off the top of their head what the lowest common multiple between 60 and 28 is? <laughs> I, 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 like I said, I forget. I, I always end up forgetting this one. <laughs> Well, in any event, that is what the order of this algorithm would be, is the lowest common multiple between those two. Um, so yeah, that's just some way that we can use these algorithms um, in a more mathematical sense, instead of just using them to uh, necessarily just solve the cube. So I guess now I want to talk a little bit more about commutators. And we got to see a bit of a commutator earlier. And I want to define a little bit what they are. So commutators and conjugates are a way to build a chain of moves. And I'm, I'm talking strictly in twisty puzzles. And they also do refer to a math term. Uh, within twisty puzzles, they have a lot of uses. But the main use is actually for blindfolded solving a cube. Um, along with if I get an exotic twisty puzzle, one that doesn't meet the you know n by n by n standard, I tend to use commutators to help me sort it out because they're very literal in what they do. And we'll re-explore one of the algorithms to uh, understand what I mean by that. Um, so a simplified definition of commutators or conjugate first is to do some moves to set up a useful task, do that task and undo the setup. And the, the conjugates typically comes in pairs. Now a commutator does a set of moves and then you do it backwards to cancel out most of what was just done. And the way that we could say that is A, B, A prime, B prime. Um, and here we can see the form of a commutator and we can see the shorthand of writing it of A comma B uh, in brackets. And then the uh, we'll look at the conjugate format early, uh, later on. Um, so this algorithm uh, right here, you can't see my cursor, but the L prime U R U prime near the bottom would be read as shown below. Um, so let's take a look at a commutator um, and show you what I mean by a little bit more of a literal sense. So we already established earlier that the order of this algorithm was three. Um, so let me get it close to the end of its cycle. And we will take a look at that. So when you're doing a commutator, you're thinking of how can I put a piece somewhere 
and then make another piece be solved. I know it's a very weird description of it, but that's essentially what's going on. Um, so looking at this example, we can say, okay, we want to solve these three pieces. They're not solved. We can say this piece, because it is blue, orange, and white needs to go. Oh, you can't see my uh, browser, can you? I'm so sorry. Can you see it now? Yeah, sorry about that. All right, so now I have the algorithm up. Um, so we can say that for this one, we want to successfully solve these three pieces because they're the only three pieces not solved. Uh, so we can say that, okay, if I were to do this move right here, it would put this piece in a solved position. Now, I want to be able to exchange uh, some of these pieces out. I want to be able to get some more pieces solved. So if I were to do the next move, I can say that I am setting up some of these. And this, because this piece right here, this orange, green, and white piece is going to be need to move up in the next move. And when it goes back around, it will change its orientation. And this, don't worry, this is some complicated stuff to understand um, if you're not familiar with the cube, but if you're familiar with uh, any sort of groups and groups theories, you, you will see how this works. So we can say that this piece is now solved and we're gonna do one last move to get it back over here. And now comes the in, uh, inversion of the algorithm uh, to do the, um, to cancel out most of what was just done so we can restore the rest of it. Because right now it looks like a jumbled mess, but we can say in this next move, we are restoring these, oh, I didn't need to skip ahead like that. We can say that in this next move, we are restoring these two pieces right here. In this move, what we're doing is moving these pieces, this uh, red green uh, pieces over here, bringing this back and now it's uh, trivial. So that's how we can say that a commutator uh, performs. And this is something that you can play around with of determining, you know, how do, how do I wanna shift these pieces to ground? If you have a cube, I encourage you to try to track some of these moves, uh, play around with it yourself and try to see if you can come up with a commutator. It's not overly difficult to come up with some basic ones. But now that we've dealt with a more complicated one, let's uh, take a look more at uh, something more basic, uh, which is conjugates. Uh, I don't know why my presentation restarted. There we go. So conjugates are the stepping stone to commutators. And we typically use them in pairs. And they're used very heavily within uh, blind solving and uh, that sort of thing. So they take the format of A, B, A prime. And I can show you probably real quick an example of a conjugate. I didn't have one preloaded, um, but within uh, this uh, particular method of solving. And so uh, what this is, is is an exchange of pieces and kind of setting pieces up. Uh, I apologize, I'm trying to type this out. I should have had this preset. Um, actually, we'll just uh, not bother with that. I'll just go ahead and uh, show the next slide. All right, so the M2 method, like I said, is primarily used for blindfolded solving. And what it's doing is it's taking uh, a piece from a specific spot called the buffer piece and moving it to another spot. And the action move in this is M2. Throughout all of these uh, uh, conjugates that you might see, uh, the action move is always M2, hence why it's called the M2 method. And since I, I don't have the virtual cube ready, I'll just show a practical example. So uh, so uh, what you're doing is solving one piece at a time. Here we go. So I can say that this is the piece that I'm starting with. And what I want to do is to get the spot that it belongs in to my target position. Because whenever I do this M2, what it does is it moves this piece, the red and blue piece, all the way up to that spot. So I can say that, OK, I'm going to put this spot, basically this spot, right here. And then do the M2 and then undo that setup. So that would be A, B, A prime. And now it looks as though I've messed up some of the cube because this middle slice is, is not uh, complete. But that's why I need to do a second one in order to complete that function. So if I were to do this, 
I would uh, then solve it. Sorry, this is a little bit harder to do inverted. <laughs> so doing that a second time then creates the pair that we need for these conjugates. Now it's not the rule that all conjugates follow. That's just the example that I'm using from this M2 method. Um, like I said, this is some rather complex stuff, but when I've taught this before, a lot of people who already know group theory are very thrilled because it gives it a practical application. Um, and people already know the cube are surprised they know so much math already. Um, so now that we're done with all that, I think we'll get into the last topic of today before we'll open up for questions, and that is the permutations of the cube. So some of you might already know uh, how many positions the cube can be in, but you might not know how to get to that number. So I'm going to pull up a drawing board here, if I can get this to cooperate. All right. All right, so we've already established throughout all of this that there are different subgroups to the cube and they interact with one another. So um, for those of you that don't know, a quick way to calculate some permutations, uh, we're going to be using factorials. So we can say since there are eight corner pieces on the cube, and I'll just draw out eight little things here. We can say that, OK, when we want to put the first corner into place, it could go in eight possible positions. So, but then when we want to place the second corner, it could go in seven possible positions. And just to be clear, it doesn't matter, you know, if I'm using this corner or this corner, it just means that um, it could go in eight possible places because it's currently a blank slate. The next one after the first one is placed could go into seven possible positions and the next one into six. And I just wanted to make sure I gave this brief example for some of you who might not know about factorials. Um, I'm sure most of you do, but just to not have anybody feel uh, left out. So we could say that the permutation of the corners is in fact eight factorial. And we can say the exact same thing for the edges. This is uh, relatively trivial to figure out these two factors. So we could do eight factorial times 12 factorial. But what makes this unique as opposed to calculating the position of a deck of cards or even um, you know, orders from a menu is that each one of these individual pieces can be in multiple different positions, which we've uh, been establishing. So we can say that, OK, for each of the eight corners, they can be in three possible positions. So we could say that eight, all right, so this would be times eight to the third power. So we can say that, uh, yeah, or no, three raised to the eight. Ah. Oh, let me erase that. Yeah, so three to the eighth, because each one of the three corners, or each one of the eight corners can be in three possible positions. So we have three to the eighth. However, we are going to run into a problem because the last corner piece within the orientation is actually predetermined. And we can actually use some modular arithmetic to help us figure this out. So if we were to assign a value to each one of these corners and say that if it is solved, it has a value of zero or three, we're using mod three, then any corner twisted in a clockwise fashion has a value of one. And any corner twisted in an anti-clockwise fashion has a value of two. Using this logic, we can say that, OK, as long as we're doing legal turns on the cube, it has to be solvable. So if I were to come up with a quick example here, we can say that this piece right here has been twisted anti-clockwise. This piece right here has been twisted clockwise. Therefore, we have a value of three. But if I manually take my cube and twist this, we can say that, OK, this only has a value of two or one. So that means that it is not solvable. And you can try this with your own cube um, and see that the value will always come out to three. But basically what this is just saying, because only having one corner twisted equals a not, it does not equal mod three, we can say that, okay, we need to remove a number from our calculation, which is just turning three to the eighth into three to the seventh. Um, and that's to deal with the orientation parity. Um, the, this is my favorite way to be able to show that, uh, to make it a little bit easier to understand. 
All right, so now we have a similar issue that we're going to run into with the edges, but we have a little bit of a different way to look at it. So we can say that each of the 12 edges can be in two possible positions. So we can say that, okay, we have two to the 12th, but you might've already guessed that the last one is predetermined. Um, but the way that we can end up showing that is, uh, well, I don't have that slide here. I'll just show you anyways. Um, is that uh, for each turn that we do, four edges are being unoriented or oriented. So if I have this right here, we say, and we know that the cube is currently solved. But if I were to turn this layer right here, we could say that this piece is now disoriented, this piece is now disoriented, this piece is now disoriented, and this piece is now disoriented, which comes out to a total of four. And if you remember what I said earlier, that when solving the cube, it's always just one turn plus one turn plus one turn plus one turn, we can say that no matter what we do, we need an even number of edges unoriented or oriented. It has to be equal to one another. Um, so then uh, we can say that, okay, we cannot just have this single edge flipped unless you manually remove it like I just did. We can go ahead and remove this right here and say that it is two to the 11th. And you'll be noticing that a lot of stuff is kind of predetermined on the cube. And we're not quite done our calculation yet because we have a few more impossible things to uh, look at, which is uh, the permutation parity. So when looking at the cube, we already know that the last corner def uh, defines, uh, the corner before the last says what the last one would be, the last edge defines what the other one will be. Um, but now looking at uh, parity, we can say that for, and this doesn't apply strictly to math, but I always like to use it, for every action there has to be an equal and opposite reaction. And I'm not going to get too in-depth into this parity because that can, be a, that can be a talk among itself. But basically what we can say is that, okay, if we have two edges swapped, we must have two corners swapped. Uh, it, it's not possible unless you take apart your cube to have just two edges like this swapped. And unfortunately in our calculation, we made the, we made it think that we could do that. And the simple fix for this, uh, because I wanna leave time for questions is just to divide this entire equation by two, because what we're saying is that, okay, any position where these two edges are swapped is impossible. And when I keep mixing up the cube, we can say that it, it will continually be impossible. Otherwise we've overcounted. And this all comes out to 43 quintillion, 252 quadrillion, 3 trillion, 274 billion, 489 million, 856,000 possible permutations. And it's written a little bit prettier here. So I think that that will be it for my talk, but I would love to be able to open up to questions and try to go in more in depth as to what any of you would like to hear. Thank you very much, Sydney. I think Tim's going to say a few bits now. Just right. about the questions. Um, so you're, Josh is in control of unmuting people. So if people would like to raise a question by audio, if you could do a hands or thumbs up, um, then Josh will unmute and spotlight you. Um, but please also put questions in the chat. And there's also the YouTube live stream chat where you can post questions. They're slightly behind us, but, but sure. they should put questions in when it turns. So we can think start, we... there are already a couple of questions in the chat. I think, yeah, I think we've got a couple. Um, we've got um, one from so, J. Brun. Yes, John Brun has got, that might take about 20 minutes on that one, but we could make a start. <laughs> <laughs> so the question from John, do you want to say it over audio, John, or shall I read it out? Oh, you can't speak. Um, but if you put your thumbs up, then Josh can unmute you. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. Well, that was a brilliant, brilliant sort of a demo and example. Thanks for sharing, Sydney. This is like, I mean, I never managed to solve the cube myself as well. So my cube would pass eventually. But um, just to, I thought the commutator moves and all those things were really helpful as a sequence, mathematical sequence. So if you start from a complete cube and then moved it five times, use five commutator moves or something, 
say you forgot how you did it and you came back to it, could you explain how I would recognize to work back to a complete cube? Right, well, that would be a bit difficult to answer. So if you're saying you just did five moves, like one, two, three, four, five, most humans can figure out how to return the cube from about five moves. Now, people like myself or practice cube more can figure it out, probably pushing seven or eight moves. If you were from this state, you could just try to see how can I solve it? And I don't want to spend too long in this example, but we can say that I can return these two pieces right here. And then I can say, OK, I can move these ones together. And then I can move these ones together. And that wasn't me just reversing by a muscle memory. It was tracking where the pieces go. Um, and remember, a commutator will take the form of A, B, A prime, B prime. So if you do sequences of moves like that, you'll probably get some interesting results. Um, but as for returning it from that, that's, that's challenging to answer. I don't really have a mathematical way to answer that. <laughs> That's just practice. <laughs> That's disappointing though. I'm sorry, I can't give a better answer. <laughs> cool, thanks. Yeah, it makes sense. I can imagine maybe there's some computer algorithm you could um, might be able to work back the most efficient number of moves. Oh, I mean, well, if you're talking about any scramble, any scramble can be solved in 20 moves or fewer from a computer standpoint. Now, most humans, um, when speed solving it, take about 50 moves. Um, and there is a competition to solve it in the fewest moves, but you're not allowed to use a computer to assist you. Uh, but the, there are some occasions where humans can see the minimal number of moves. For example, to solve the, uh, the first four edges on a face, um, just like this, would not take any more than eight moves. And most humans can figure that out. Uh, but you're only dealing with four little pieces instead of a huge subgroup. Well, thank you. Brilliant. You're welcome. I'll, give it, I'll find my cube and give it a go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We've got a couple of questions from Matt Jerry. He'd like to know your initial scramble for the 10 second solve and also what cube you use and what method. <laughs> All right, well, Matt, I'm going to be honest and say it was just a hand scramble. My timer currently has four by four scrambles up, so I just mix it up by hand. Um, as for the method I use, um, I use CFOP, which stands for cross F2L orientation of the last layer, permutation of the last layer. And the cube I use uh, is called the MFR3S, or otherwise nicknamed the license plate cube. <laughs> And Baxter would like some advice for a new starter. <laughs> so Baxter, I would recommend the best way you can learn is just go ahead and hop onto YouTube and find some videos. If you find that you struggle with self-learning, there are people like myself who teach private lessons and some other people out there who would be more than happy to help you. But just you know, start and don't be afraid to make mistakes because that's how you learn more. Uh, thankfully, all the information is available on the internet, uh, pretty easily accessible. James, have we got any questions on the live stream? And um, please raise your hands if you want to ask anything. We have nothing on the YouTube live stream, unfortunately. No questions. Yeah, I, I've got a question when you're ready as well. Go for it, Chris. Sure. Um, so. Would every set of moves have an order, as in every closed group of uh, moves repeating it for some number of t some number of times, and would you eventually reach the uh, completed cube? Yes. So assuming that you started with the solved cube, if you keep doing an algorithm over and over and over again, it will eventually become solved. The orders we were dealing with today were shorter, but if you were to take a scramble algorithm, which as you can imagine is incredibly random, you could eventually figure out how long it would take. It would take an unbearable amount of time, but yes, every single algorithm does have an order and it will return to a solved state. I have a question if no one else wants to raise one now. Um, although, James, maybe you had your hand up as well, but maybe you were applauding. I was applauding. Uh, I have not got a question. 
um, which is the software you use for visualization, which might have been in your talk. Sorry, I missed five minutes. Is that, Wait, what, is that what freely is the, available? What? The one, the cube Wait, I'm, visualization. I'm Cube is oh that oh the program yeah yeah um I I can put the link in the chat yeah <laughs> uh, so this was made um has been around for a couple of years uh, by Lucas Guerin who is another speed cuber who's a good friend of mine and I happen to just use it in my presentations it can be um a little challenging to use because you do have to type in stuff there is no click and drag with the cube but um you can just copy and paste algorithms do backslash backslash for comments um. And a whole bunch of other stuff. I was thinking for teaching of group theory, for example, might be quite yeah, engaging. I, it honestly is a phenomenal tool for teaching group theory, um, especially when you can have some hands on experience. So I see Peter has a question in the chat. Is there a maximum number of moves for the algorithms you use? Is there an average number of moves? I, I'd say that's a pretty good question in terms of uh, speed solving. Um, so the first two thirds of the cube you're solving intuitively, but you try to do it in you know a somewhat short number of moves. With the first step, you know you don't want it to take any more than eight moves. But then the next step of solving the uh, first two thirds, you try to do it in maybe I think 30 moves. I never really keep track of that. And then for orienting the last layer. I'd say most of the uh, algorithms and don't quote me on this probably average out to about 10 moves. Um, and there's 57 unique cases. And then for permuting them, that probably averages out to about 15 moves. I've not actually checked the numbers on that. Uh, but in general, I won't memorize an algorithm if it's longer than 20 moves. It's probably not worth it if it's longer than that. Anything more on the YouTube live stream, James? Still nothing. No, nobody's, nobody's going your, to the chat. They're asking for your soundtrack earlier, I think. Yeah, well, I, uh, I dealt with that. I, I could ask another question if there are no hands up. Oh, there's another one. Marcus has got a question. Let's go to Marcus. Josh, could you unmute? I don't know if Marcus is just asking it in... Uh, Oh, I can ask the question to be more detailed if that helps. So the, the question is more about, um, I guess the, the Rubik's cube itself is sort of set up with colors and in a three dimensional cube, obviously. But are there kind of higher dimensional versions of that? So for example, where you have colors and patterns where you want to solve something which is sort of following like another dimension of the groups you're actually solving. So. There are some unique twisty puzzles. I'm not sure the exact question you're answering, but I'll just answer a few at once. <laughs> there are four dimensional cubes. There is one practical one that was 3D printed using magnets. Um, and as long as you follow the rules, it does act as though it's in the fourth dimension. There are certain cubes which are called picture cubes where um, they might have numbers on them or uh, a picture and you have to try to solve that, which would affect the center orientation as opposed to having solid color. Um, oh, James just sent a four, uh, 4D cube in the chat, great. Um, and then there are certain puzzles which do have a puzzle within a puzzle. Those are a little bit more gimmicky, but when you turn it, it does affect an inner uh, mechanic. And something, you know, just because we're on the topic of it, uh, any of the bigger end by end puzzles that are even have a um, basically a bigger puzzle hidden within them. And this is going to be difficult to show on camera, but here's a four by four. And within this is actually the pieces to a five by five, which make it possible to function. And I, I'll take this apart, but I'll regret it later um, to show you kind of what these edges look like. And we talked a little bit about the subgroups on a five by five, and this would be the equivalent to the middle edge on a five by five. And I can pull up the picture of the five by five now. Um, we can say that this is equal to the midge while these are the wing edges. So these kind of are kept together like so and hidden within the puzzle. Just a little bit of fun. Um, maybe some engineer people might like to hear that. <laughs> Let's see here. Do you always follow a strict algorithm of speed solving or are there 
uh, I don't know what ADHOC shortcuts. Um, Improvise. Ad hoc. Um, yeah. Improvise, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I'd say that in general, I follow the set of algorithms that I know, which is, you know, cl somewhere around a thousand of them. Um, but occasionally I'll do something for fun, depending on if I'm competing or just uh, solving the cube casually. It all just depends um, on the circumstances. Sometimes it's fun to take a chance. <laughs> um, Matt asks, what is your record for the three by three? Um, Yes, thank you for putting my profile in the chat. Uh, my official fastest solve is 7.48. You'll be able to see the exact time there. And my fastest at home is 4.27. I could ask my question now. I don't want to butt in though. <laughs> Go ahead. I think there was um, one from, uh, another one from, uh, Peter, but go ahead, Tim. I was just wondering if you'd like to share how you got into cubing and what's involved in becoming a gold medalist in terms of how many hours you put in and so forth. All right, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I started cubing when I was 14. I had initially gotten a cube in my stocking, but it was from a dollar store or a pound store, whatever you want to call it. It was terrible. I didn't have any interest when I got it, but then come a few months later, um, you know, summer vacation, I was very, very bored and thought, well, there's gotta be a way to solve this. And having had a laptop, I decided to look up these instructions and um, I found the you can do the Rubik's cube guide uh, on, just online. I read it because I prefer reading things to videos and saw that, hey, this actually isn't too hard. And I remember when I first was trying to learn, I got as far as this um, with the guide and got a little frustrated because I couldn't make the algorithm work. And I remember um, my brother saying that you must have cheated and taken it apart. But then eventually I learned the algorithm and thought, okay, well, I just did this, let me do it faster. And that's kind of how a lot of speed cubers start is that you take what you know and you learn about six or seven algorithms when you start and say, how fast can I do this? And using that dollar store cube, I got down to about a minute, but it just fell apart. And then eventually I got a Rubik's brand cube, which I was thrilled by, even though they're terrible to my standards today, but it allowed me to get down to 20 seconds. From, so from the day I started to about three months later, I got down to about that speed. And how I learned was just uh, reading the speed solving Wikipedia, learning algorithms and um, just seeing what people were doing. I would watch solve videos and study how they're getting faster. Um, and I'd probably would spend maybe three or four hours a day cubing, practicing. So it's a lot of dedication. It's, um, you know, just like playing an instrument or anything like that, the more you practice, the faster you'll get. Um, I didn't get my first gold medal, I don't think until 2015, and I've been cubing since 2013. So it, it did take some time, but with enough effort, anybody <laughs> can achieve something like that. <laughs> So I think Peter's question that I pushed in front of is what about four by four by four cubes? Um, as in for the number of moves. So the four by four actually is incredibly unexplored in the terms of how few moves it would take to solve it. We just don't know. The amount of computing power it would take uh, would be probably in the amount that Google has. It's just, it would take hours upon hours of computing power. Um, fun fact, some students from Stanford or Berkeley, one of those schools actually borrowed computing power from Google in order to figure out God's number on the Rubik's Cube itself. Um, but for four by four, we just don't have enough information yet. And then Baxter's getting into the details of professional cubing and whether there's a standardized initial st shuffle <laughs> or method for um, shuffling. So when you are competing, you um, are given the same scramble as um, other competitors, and it's just a random scramble. You can see here on uh, my phone timer, uh, but you know, once I start and stop it, it becomes different. 
Now the delegate at a competition is given or generates specific scrambles. Um, there are certain requirements that the program has, like it can't take any fewer than 13 moves, I think, something like that. Um, but overall, uh, they are pretty random. Uh, and they would be different for every single competition, but the same group of 15 or 20 people at a competition would probably get the same scrambles. As it's coming up to four o'clock, I think I'll do thank yous, but I was hoping at the very end, if we could have everyone unmuted, if people wanted to just have a general chat. Um, but I, I'm going to thank the team again, I guess. Um, so James and Josh for keeping everything peaceful and well moderated. Um, James Brace and James Arthur for inviting Sydney and doing some excellent hosting. And also Chris and Beth for um, the introductions to the societies and for helping get this off the ground and all the amazing work you do with the two math societies. Um, so I'm gonna start the round of applause reactions, um, but people can like do proper claps as well if they want. Um, but most of all, thank you, Sydney, for a fantastic talk. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you to the uh, all the teams that helped to make this happen. Uh, it's just, it's been wonderful. You've been a great uh, audience. <laughs> Thank you, Josh, when you're ready, you could release the unmute all, which might be a bit dangerous. Yeah, people, people no, should be able to unmute themselves now. This is going to be dangerous. God help us. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I can do as one last thing, a one-handed solve or a four by four solve, whatever people want to see, if they want to see another speed solve, since we're kind of done with questions. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <know>. please. Oh. <laughs> All right, I see one-handed, one-handed, okay. <laughs> yeah, just my camera. Anybody have any guesses of as to how long this will take, since I'll be only using one hand? 20 seconds. I feel like whoever said that cheated because they knew in the email. <laughs> <laughs> totally not me. 19.8 seconds. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> Made a few mistakes this solve, but that's quite all right. There we go. <laughs> 24 seconds. Not my best. <laughs> Good. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I see Josephine ask, what is my favorite cube type? I probably favor the Megaminx the most, which is a 12-sided uh, uh, Rubik's Cube in the shape of a dodecahedron. Of course, there's the decahedron cube. I'm not sorry. <laughs> there's a cube in any shape you can imagine, like honestly. Even if they might be I'm not surprised uh, to be honest. 